Hey guys, this is John, and welcome to another installment of Chess Fundamentals. So far in this series, which launched more than a year and a half ago, which is hard to believe, we've talked about undefended pieces, coordination, pawn play. We had one of my former students, Zach, come on, and he played a few games for our benefit while I commentated. So we're kicking it up a notch now, and we're going to talk about trades in this video. So I'm going to dive right into things. I'm looking for a 5 plus 5 game. I'm setting the rating range between 1200 and 2000. If you're wondering why I'm using the old version of chess.com, it's because the new version does not allow you to search by rating range, which is kind of odd. I don't know why that's the case. So I'm using the old version. Let's get right into a game. So the major thing I want to mention right off the bat as far as trades go is that if you can't describe a reason why a trade is at minimum neutral for you and preferably advantageous for you, then you probably have no business making that trade in the first place. Let me say that again. If you can't describe a reason why a trade is at minimum neutral for you and preferably advantageous, then you have no business making that trade. And this applies to positions where you have some choice in the matter. So there are positions where you're forced into making a swap of pieces or a swap of pawns. You just have no other moves or very limited options. But for the most part, you should be following that rule. And it sounds obvious, but so many people make the mistake of not following that. They just swap pawn for pawn or piece for piece with no particular thought behind it. So I'm going to try to describe some of these scenarios and drill it into your brain that you should be very critical of every trade you make in chess, and there should be reasoning behind those trades. Okay, so already right here on move number three, I play d4 proposing a trade. Now, some people might criticize this trade that I just made because I traded a center pawn my D pawn for one of Black's wing pawns, their C pawn, which is in the long run a slight disadvantage. So Black now has two center pawns to my one. However, I do get this nice knight in the center. So you could say that this trade facilitated my development a little bit and allowed me to occupy the middle with this nice piece. This knight could be annoying for Black in the future. So Black is bringing out a piece right here. I'm going to play my bishop to G5. I frequently like doing this against Nidorf type setups. This is not a Sicilian Nidorf yet because black has not played a6, but I am treating it as such. And let's play pawn f4. I'm fond of this plan of bringing the queen out to f3 and then castling long. So in the course of discussing trades, we're not gonna forget about the other stuff that I mentioned. So undefended pieces, coordinating our forces, and pawn play. That's all going to play into it. We're trying to build on top of each other with these videos. So h6. All right, so do I want to take this knight with my bishop? You notice I had that option before. I could have done this on the last couple moves if I wanted, or before f4, rather. But I'm going to hold off on this trade, and I am going to bring my bishop back because I don't feel I would benefit from bishop takes f6 immediately. Generally, and this is especially true if you're a little more advanced, if you're not like a pure beginner, you should prefer your bishops a bit more to your opponent's knights. So you talk to good players, they don't like swapping the bishops for knights for no particular reason. And in fact, chess engines are programmed that way. They actually weight the bishops slightly higher in their algorithms. So that should tell you something about how strong players value uh, certain pieces. Now I wonder actually if based on black's move order, I might have made a slight tactical mistake because black could try knight takes e4 here which would be a discovery against my bishop on h4. And one idea in that case is, if I play bishop takes e7 in in-between move, black can play knight takes c3. I can take their queen on d8, but then they take my queen on d1. So this could be rather embarrassing. I might have dropped a pawn in my first uh, explanatory game regarding traits. <laughs> so we'll see if black notices that. I will definitely highlight this moment in the post-mortem if it comes to pass, even if it doesn't come to pass. But fingers crossed black doesn't play knight takes e4, because I think knight takes e4 is a good move. In that case, it leads me to believe that bishop takes f6 probably should have been played, so I avoid losing a pawn. La Hoy, 1494 is thinking hard, and he played it. Credit to La Hoy. Nice find, sir. Okay, so this is going to be fun. You're going to see me try to come back from a potential one-pawn deficit. So... If I'm going to take one of Black's pieces, I have two choices, right? Bishop takes e7 or knight takes e4. Bishop takes e7 or knight takes e4. I already described the line that could occur after bishop takes e7. Bishop takes e7, knight takes c3. There's some weird stuff that could happen, though. I wonder if 
Queen g4 is possible there. Am I crazy for looking at that? Queen g4, queen takes e7, queen takes g7. And then I might be able to get my knight back, and we have equal material. I would have won my pawn back in the process. I'm going to spend a little time on this move because this is important. The game has suddenly sharpened up. And if the game is sharpening, if there's tactics to consider, you've got to spend the extra effort and the extra time to figure out what the heck is going on. So, yeah, bishop takes e7 is the move I really would like to play here. Knight takes e4, bishop takes h4 is just a pawn. That comes with check. I'm liking that line that I just described. Bishop takes e7, knight takes c3, queen g4. I guess they could play king takes e7, but at least I have some compensation maybe in the form of black's king being in the center. Let's give that a shot. La Jolla from Canada already putting me to a stiff test here. The other line I just wanted to make sure is if queen g4, if queen a5 is a problem. But I don't think so. I don't think queen a5 is a big issue. So let's go ahead and pull the trigger on this guy. e5, nah, e5 is nothing to be concerned about. Didn't think I was going to get such a complex game right off the bat, but that's what we came here for. <laughs> and you guys like to see me suffer a little bit too. That's always fun. All right, so these trades, it's hard to comment on them generally because they're just specific to the position in front of you. Uh, the last couple moves that we made, bishop takes e7 for me, knight takes c3 in reply for him. Those are like in-between moves, or you could consider them desperados, where black is trying to extract some value by making this counterattacking move and not taking me right away. Okay, so now I'm going to make another in-between move. I'm going to take this pawn on g7, attacking the rook, which is more valuable than black's knight on c3. I'm hoping to win that knight next after black addresses their rook problem. So if black plays, say, rook f8, I'll play b takes c3. And if we count up the pawns, it will be even. Unfortunately for me, my pawn structure is pretty wonky. I'll have an isolated a pawn and double isolated c pawns. So I'm kind of worse in the pawn structure department after that, but the position is quite messy. I mean, if this rook goes to f8, then black's h6 pawn will always be under attack. I do have a slight lead in development. I've got my knight out in the center. Maybe the possibility of a bishop coming to b5 would check. Probably I'll whisk my king away to the king side. I don't think if I play b takes c3, I'm going to want to castle queen side. That seems pretty foolhardy, given that I have little pawn protection over there. I actually think black should have taken with the king on the previous move. So king takes e7. Okay, so my opponent is proposing a queen trade. That might be a wise decision. And I have to take this queen trade because otherwise I will not win my piece back. So let's swap. And then I'm going to take on c3 next move. Okay, so after those adventures, we get equal material. The game is just starting now. I have to somehow make up for my slightly worse pawn structure. It's not that bad yet, but I think La Jolla can be happy with the result of the opening for now, at least. So one, I'm, one idea I'm thinking of is playing knight b5 if he lets me, which would attack the d6 pawn and also threaten knight to c7 check. So that would be a double attack. He could cover both of those threats with king to d7, but that's an awkward move. That would disrupt his coordination. That would block his bishop on c8. So if I were black, I would strongly consider playing a6. It looks like he should make a developing move, but I think a6 would be a smart idea. Spending one more tempo just to ensure a piece doesn't land on b5. Likewise, maybe bishop d7 is okay too. Yep, yeah, and there he goes, a6. Good idea. Okay, so I want to get this light square bishop out. Black does have some undefended stuff. Undefended pawn on d6, undefended pawn on h6. I don't see how I'm going to target that yet. So I think I should just bring this bishop somewhere. Maybe bishop e2. Could also try to play rook b1 if I like, which eyes up this pawn on b7. Let's throw that in. I'm going to play rook b1 just to see how he reacts to the potential attack there.
If black decides to push b5, that may be, give me a hook to latch onto. Maybe I could propose a trade with pawn to c4, which would be doubly good if there were a black bishop on b7. I'd have a pin going down the b-file. If black plays knight c6, I probably will not take their knight because, in my opinion, that would help strengthen black's structure. So they get to capture towards the center, they'll have a little more influence. They would isolate their a-pawn in the process, but playing b takes c6 in general should be helpful to black. Okay, so their black goes with the knight out. I'm going to play a bishop move now. I think bishop e2. And let's see if we can derive some benefit from black trading on d4. So I'm trying to convince him to swap knights on my terms. Then I can undouble my pawns. My c3 pawn will make its way to d4. I think I should be happy with that. He is using a lot of time. He's under a minute now. We do have that five second increment, but that has to be concerning for black. Black can't play bishop d7 because they would lose the pawn on c6. Maybe they could play bishop d7, rook takes b7, knight takes d4, c takes d4, bishop c6, hitting the rook and the pawn on g2. But somehow I don't think that's wise for black with me getting a bunch of activity like rook coming to b6 after that. He's got to move faster though. He's kind of freezing up here. Under 20 seconds now. Okay, so black does take. I'm happy to see that move. I feel like I have gained a bit by making this swap. Undouble those pawns. That's the sort of thing you can do when you start proposing trades on your own terms. If I was just interested in swapping, I would have blindly chopped on c6 and got nothing out of it. Okay, king d7. So the king might be coming over to this square to try to support the b7 pawn. I could see that being... A plan. Black still has this undefended pawn. I'd love to swing up maybe a rook over to h3 and attack it. Although that takes a couple moves. I'm not sure about that. Bishop f3 looks normal. Bishop f3, black might play d5, thereby trying to block my bishop. f5 is intriguing. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to castle. Even though we are in an endgame, I feel like castling improves my coordination. Maybe now I can bring this rook up to f3 and look for either rook h3 or rook c3 check. Yeah, let's try that. So rook f3. My rook is patrolling the third rank. Can go to a number of different squares from here. I just don't think black's going to make it on the clock, unfortunately. Yeah, he almost flagged right there. Okay, so do we check or play rook h3? Probably we can throw in rook h3 if we'd like. A plan that I sort of like here, it's sort of caveman-ish, but rook h3, rook h8, and then bring the other rook up to b3. Yeah, let's do this. So attack that weak pawn. And I'm going to send this other guy up to b3, maybe in the hopes of doubling on the h-file. That's my big idea. Let's bring him up here. Black can play e5, but I have a check over here. So attack the king, and next I can go take this pawn. His idea was that my bishop, or his bishop, was attacking my rook on h3, but once we throw in that check, we get out of the way, and I can take the pawn on e5 next. All right, so kind of a sloppy affair, a 21-move game that ended in a time win. Not ideal, but... There were some aspects of trading to highlight in this one, and as well as some other stuff, independent pieces, coordination, pawn play, all the things that we're trying to bring together. So let's have a quick look at that. So I played the Sicilian, and the first trade was proposed on move three when I played d4. This is a book move. This is theory. But some will argue that because of this trade, white has taken on a long-term defect. And I think that's actually pretty a pretty solid line of argument. Most Sicilian players as white and black will agree with that. Black's two center pawns to, white, to white's single center pawn does represent a potential long-term advantage for black. White is hoping to make up for that with their influence in the center and their active piece play. So we've already got this knight 
on the menacing d4 square, where it has a lot of options going towards the queen side or the king side. So when black does not play the normal move here, which is knight f6 attacking the pawn, and instead plays a move like e6, I should actually probably take the opportunity, or I should think about taking the opportunity, of playing something like c4. c4 and then developing my knight to c3 behind it. That might be a better coordination um, array than with my knight on c3 with the pawn on c2, as normally happens, and as I played in this case, knight c3 immediately here. There is a certain sense of harmony you get when you see the pawn up on c4 and the knight behind it, with the pawn helping to control space in the center too. The knight and the pawn complement each other nicely, enhance control over these, as opposed to the pawn on c2, which is just blocked by the knight. So I was kind of explaining the position and just completely glossed over this decision. But yes, I should have thought about playing c4 there. And then after knight f6, bishop g5, pinning the knight and developing, bishop e7. So I'm not taking on f6 right away. That would be a pretty bad decision this early on. That would be the, a sign of uh, a weak player, I think, if your first instinct was just to chop on f6. And there's nothing wrong with that if that was what you first thought about, because a lot of people's instincts are to trade pieces. Because oftentimes, piece trades are the easiest moves to rationalize. You're like, my bishop is worth three, his knight's worth three. Well, this move can't be that bad, right? And the fact that it can't be that bad is what gets you to actually play the move. But those little concessions that you're making, they can quickly add up, especially against a good player. They can take those and just run with them. So unless I see a solid reason to do the trade, I'm not going to do it. So I played f4 instead. But in view of what happened, this is probably a mistake. I mean, I'm already kind of out of book here because of um, the, the way black is playing this opening. And maybe I should play something like, I don't know, I could think about even moves like queen d2 right away if I want to prepare castle and queenside. That might be a better option. That gives me one more defender of this square. I might have to drop my bishop back to e3 if black ever attacks it with h6. But I think in view of what happened, I probably committed an error right there. f4, h6. And now I might be obligated to trade if I don't want to lose a pawn. Bishop takes f6. As much as I would hate to give up my bishop for the knight without having anything to show for it, maybe I could claim that the d6 pawn is now weaker. It doesn't have the bishop defending it, but I think black should be able to rebuff a move like knight db5 fairly easily. This is attacking this pawn, but after bishop e7, do I have a follow-up? Probably not. I'd love for my queen to be on d2 so that I could follow up with castling on this move and add another attacker, but I'm not quite in time. Black would be smart to play a6 right now and kick this knight back before I have a chance to castle and lean on that d6 pawn again. So even still, though, I think I should trade on f6 because the alternative was, was worse. After bishop h4, black unleashed this nice tactic. Knight takes e4. And maybe black has played something similar to this. They seem to be, they paused for a moment here, and they seem to be zeroed in on uh, the error that I just committed. So just to recap this, if I take with the knight, black plays bishop takes h4 check. I have to respond to the check. They're just going to retreat. Black's up a clean pawn. So the only other thing to do is what I did in the game, which is take on e7. And now we get into in-between move territory. So Zwischenzug, uh, which is the, the German word for in-between move or intermezzo. So I'm playing a move that is going to require black to also play an in-between move to stay afloat. Because if black made like the normal move, which would be to take my bishop, then I'm taking their knight and I've just won a piece for a pawn. So whenever these in-between moves start to appear on the board, like redouble your efforts, try to figure out what's really going on because this is where tactical errors like often happen. It's very easy to lose sight of what's going on if you're responding with like asymmetrical captures or moves that are unexpected. Most of the time, if you take something, your opponent's going to take back. Like it's very basic. You take me, I take you, etc. But in this case, it's like you take me and then I take some other piece on uh, a different part of the board that you weren't expecting. So... That's what happened when black played in this one. Knight takes c3 on move 9. So bishop takes e7, knight takes c3. And to avoid being a pawn down, as would happen after just b takes c3 and queen takes e7, I tried this interesting move, knight, uh, queen to g4. So figuring that 
Black is going to have to address my bishop, and maybe I can snag this g7 pawn before taking the knight, which is in fact what happened. But if Black had taken with the king, even though that messes up their castling right, I think that's okay for them because now I can't afford to take on g7 because this rook is defended by Black's queen. So Black could just move this knight away to safety. And again, even though Black's king is messed up, I don't think I have anything to show for my sacrifice material. So king takes e7 was probably an improvement there for black. Instead, black took with the queen. I take on g7. Black needs to address this threat on the rook. So black played queen f8. Rook f8 was another move, but I think queen f8 is a good idea. Trade, black took with the rook. Take here. And I think black should be fine in this resulting position. I, as white, am happy that I avoided losing a pawn, but I've had to undertake some structural damage. My pawns on the queen side are very weak, so I'm not happy about that. And La Hoy played some good moves. A6, stopping me from using the B5 square. It's just they played too slowly after this. Now, this is basically what I'm hoping to talk about in this video. When black plays knight C6, don't just go to take that knight right away or move your knight away. Try to identify what you, had, you stand to gain by black making the trade on your terms. So instead of you just thinking about knight takes c6 or avoiding the trade entirely, moving the knight somewhere. Think about what would happen if black actually followed through and took your knight. As far as I can tell, that only benefits me because I get to undouble these pawns. So that's why I played a useful move here, a developing move, bishop e2. I'm letting black come to me. Whereas if I do that, I think black is just getting a strengthened center. Yes, this pawn is a little weaker, but still, black structure makes a stronger impression than mine. So after I played uh, bishop to e2, black took on d4, and my wish was fulfilled. I was able to somewhat straighten out my pawns. And I think black is still completely fine here, but again, the time was a big factor. And notice how those undefended pieces cropped up, like this was the basis for my mini plan right here, swinging the, look, the rooks along the third rank. Rook h3, target the h6 pawn. Rook b3. Now one idea I have is rook up to h5 and rook over here. Try to attack this a couple times. Yeah, now black tried e5, opening up the bishop towards the rook, but that turns out to be a, a bit of a tactical mistake because of the check move. And here black flagged, but if they had got out of check, then I was planning just to take and end up winning a pawn. I should be able to keep that pawn too. Okay, so enough about this game. Eventful one. Let's look for another game. See if I can redeem myself in the opening. One thing I wanted to mention while we wait for a game here. So since the series came out, I've had a chance to read through a lot of the comments and just get a, a good sense of what people think of the Chess Fundamentals videos and just fundamental chess concepts in general because people were making a lot of good suggestions uh, for future topics. One thing that I hear people talk about a lot is a thought process. Everyone wants to know about, this game got aborted, let's try a new one. Everyone wants to know like what's the ideal thought process in chess? Like what is this magical formula that will lead me to the best move in any position? And I want to tell you guys like that formula doesn't exist. And if you meet someone who tells you that it exists, uh, you should not believe them because as far as I know, there's nothing like that that a human can comprehend that will help you over the board. Now, chess engines are programmed in a way that they have complex algorithms that help them come up with the best moves. But we as humans, even if we knew what those algorithms were, I guess computer chess computer programmers have access to that information, but I certainly don't as a lay person, they wouldn't even be helpful for us because it's such a complex thing. Just worry about improving your own game and improving your thought process by playing your own games. And also like taking advice from stuff you hear on videos and what you read in books. Don't worry about like the ideal formula because it doesn't exist. There are certain things that you can help you refine your own formula, but ultimately if you ask a good player like how they decide on a certain move, they're gonna tell you like it's based on experience, man. Like that's what it comes down to. I'm not like doing like calculus in my head to find the best move here. I look at a board and I'm so attuned to looking for certain things. You know, many of the things we're talking about, uh, coordination, undefended pieces, pawn play, king safety, 
uh, when I can take the initiative, all of that sort of thing. It, it all just coalesces in my brain. And I guess if you want to get really precise, your unconscious will find the best move for you. It's not a conscious thought process. I'm not thinking, uh, at least in, in pretty simple positions, like how I can come to the best move by applying a formula. It's never like that. So semi-rant on that topic, but <laughs> I wanted to get that out there. Okay, so pretty normal game so far, just a symmetric king's pawn position. I could develop my light square bishop, but I'm kind of curious if black is going to pin me with bishop g5. could also play h6 if I wanted to stop that idea. You know what? Let's just play a6. This move looks kind of like a time-wasting move, and I have warned you guys about playing early rook pawn moves in the opening. But my idea is that if, black plays, if white plays knight a4, I want a space to drop my bishop back to on a7. Okay, so now that I've convinced white to play bishop g5, I'm going to play h6 and see if they swap. White could have kept the pin. They could have played bishop h4, in which case I might have played pawn g5. I'll talk about that after the game. But okay, so white has made this trade of a bishop for the knight. I am not unhappy with that trade. Now I have to go back to c7 to defend this pawn. Because unless white has something to show for having given up the bishop pair, I don't know that that was a good swap for them on f6. If I were white, I would think about ways in the short term here that he could play for an initiative, because otherwise he might not have a chance. Okay, now I could think about bishop to g4. I think I'm going to play that move. Unless, wait a second, John. If bishop g4, am I going to run into knight takes e5? Similar tactic to what I ran into next uh, on the last game. That might actually work. Bishop takes e2, knight takes c6, bishop takes here. Yeah, I don't like the look of that. I'm just going to castle. We're going to play a safe move for now. White c4 move does weaken the d4 square. This is a square I'm eyeing. I'd love to plant a knight here if I could. If I could get a permanent knight on that outpost, I would be loving life. Okay, a3, what does white want to do? They're trying to push b4, for sure. So do I try to address that threat? Do I let it happen? Still love to do this and then take the knight, but I don't think it's panning out in the short term. So bishop g4, knight takes e5 is still working out in white's favor, I believe. Is it bishop g4, knight takes e5, bishop takes e2, knight takes c6? Ah, I can actually just take back, can't I? Yeah, I think I can just take back on e2. Okay, I think I can play this move. Maybe I miscalculated. So knight takes e5, bishop takes e2, knight takes c6. I can just play b takes c6. And then white will either have to give, get back their bishop with queen takes e2, which would allow their knight to hang, or move their knight and then I take their queen. So that's not going to turn out well for them. Okay, so b4. Now I could take on f3 right away, but what's the rush? Maybe I can benefit from avoiding this trade for now. Yeah, let's just drop this bishop back. Nothing else tactically is going to change after knight takes e5. It still runs into bishop takes e2, knight takes c6, b takes c6. So let's play it cool for a moment. But I would like to play, at some point, bishop captures knight in order to conquer the d4 square. That's what I am having to show for making this trade of the light square bishop for the knight. Otherwise, I wouldn't play bishop takes f3. There's not a good enough reason. Okay, so let's plan out our strategy here. I think I'm going to play a takes b5, c takes b5, bishop takes f3, bishop takes f3, and knight d4. I think I, I like the look of that plan. Yeah, let's do that. So first take here. Bishop takes f3 is going to be an in-between move. Importantly, after bishop takes f3, if b takes c6, I can play bishop takes e2, hitting that queen. That's a move that helps me in a lot of variations. Like, disrupts white's plan of just chopping everything on the queen side. Okay, so now we're going to jump into the promised land. This d4 square. My knight is a lot more powerful on d4 than white's is on d5, even though they are complementary squares in the center, because I have the option of chasing his knight by playing c6 at any given moment. Whereas white does not have that same luxury. Remember when they played that pawn up to c4? I was talking about how it weakened the d4 square. This is a good example. Why? So, again, as far as trading goes, do I want to play knight takes f3? Give up my glorious knight 
for this bishop that is just basically blocked by white's own pawns? Absolutely not. Unless I had a good way to capitalize on that. Maybe you could argue for knight takes f3, queen takes f3, bishop d4, hitting the rook, followed by c6. Like, that's a move that's on my radar. I don't think I have to jump on that yet, though. I'm actually thinking of just playing bishop c5. Let's just improve our bishop a little bit. Get my rook on a8, working towards that pawn on a4. And c6 could be on the agenda. Let's let white suffer with this bishop, which, as far as I can tell, is virtually unemployed in this position. Yeah, bishop g4. He's trying to improve his prospects with that piece. Makes sense. Now I might go for this c6 move. I could also do some stuff like maybe try to double up on the a file, but I think I need to start with c6. Yeah, let's begin with that move. Kick out that knight. Got to watch my time a little bit. My opponent is killing me on the clock right now. Okay, so one thing white could do, and this might actually be the best plan for them, is to try to trade knight for knight. So yeah, they might be getting into position to set up a knight swap, like knight to c2. Knight c3 to e2 would have been another plan. So a pretty good idea for white. I want to attack this pawn with everything I've got. So let's play, let's play rook a6. Eh, let's go rook a5 instead. Both moves I think are good. Maybe knight c4 white can play. I probably should have put the rook on a6. Still not too bad. My idea is queen to a8, basically. And doubling up, trying to attack this pawn. So white gained a tempo by hitting my rook, but I think in the long run they would still like to trade off my knight on d4. That seems to be white's best plan. Hmm, okay, so I think that's a clear sign that white is trying for f4. They're going to look to get this move in. Maybe I should send the queen over to g5 for this reason. Change of plans? Maybe. I'd also like to perhaps play d5, although I don't want to lose e5. Let's play queen g5, see how that goes. Stopping f4 for the time being. Eyeing up this bishop. Good game so far by Raul Milano. Maybe he should go g3 and try for that f4 idea. That would be okay. Well, so far, I am I feel like I'm talking about a lot of instructive things, but my positions are maybe not reflecting um, some of the things that I'm, I'm trying to impress upon you guys. <laughs> so I got to do better in the course of this session. Okay, f3. That strikes me as an ugly move because his bishop is defended, but it can't ever retreat this way. So there might be some issues with that bishop being trapped in the future. I'm going to keep that in mind. Let's play our rook over. We've got optimal coordination going on now. All pieces performing some function. Good knight in the center. Bishop defending d6, also defending the knight. Doubled rooks attacking this. Queen out, causing some trouble on the opposite wing. So from a coordination standpoint, I'm liking this. Their queen is kind of glued to the d1 square because that is helping to support the a-pawn. Hard to come up with an idea for white. I think they needed to stake... Their claim to g3 followed by f4. That would have been the most uh, intimidating line of play, I think, at least from my perspective here as black. What will I do next if given the choice? I might play for d5. I'm still considering this idea. Okay, so this move does not contain a threat because this pawn is defended twice. So d5 is still... Pretty darn tempting. Yeah, I'm going to go for that move. Got to watch that time a little bit, too. Try to force this knight to a bad square. I think ultimately, if I can trade my dark square bishop for his knight, then that would further drive home the point that my d4 knight is excellently placed. Okay, so now we've got two center pawns to white's one. That trade should benefit me. For that reason, also notice... That white's d3 pawn is isolated. 
due to that trade White just made. So I, I think White made a concession right there. Let's play the queen back here, attack that bishop. I'm going to try for bishop a3, hunting down that knight. Man, that knight's on an awkward square now, isn't it? Yeah, let's let's go for it. I could also think about attacking it via rook b8 or rook b6, but we'll start with bishop a3, see where white goes. Kind of running out of squares for that piece, aren't they? I mean, it can't go to a safe square now. It can only be defended, like rook a2 or rook b1. Queen d2 could run into knight b3 with a fork on the queen and the rook. What to do for white? Yeah, awkward position. So right now I'm just trying to use my time to figure out what I'm going to do against rook b1 and rook a2, because I think those are white's best chances. I'm thinking of just a, whoa, that just drops the knight. But I was thinking of um, switching gears and not really worrying about the a pawn, but instead going after the knight entirely. Okay, so can I snatch on a4? I think so. It's a little bit greedy, but nah, there's not much to worry about. Famous last words in chess. <laughs> of course, you should never relax until the game is actually over with. I've seen even the most overwhelming games reversed in a manner of in a matter of a move or two. We've all had those games where we like walk into checkmate or stalemate or something from an otherwise dominating position. Uh, I'm going to take this guy. Again, I don't see why not. This bishop's protected. He can maybe try for f4, looking to put pressure on e5. I'll just push past with e4 if white does that. Queen there, okay. Let's go here. Trying to get out of the e-file pin. Also support my rook. Got to watch those loose pieces, though. Like, this rook on a8 is undefended. We can't lose sight of that. And the bishop is pinned, so we can't move it away anywhere for fear of losing this. Ah, nicely played by white, but does that work? Okay, I'm going to take this guy. Now, he's going to take my rook on c4. I actually don't really mind that trade because at least the position was simplified somewhat. Now I'm thinking of rook discoveries, some nasty rook moves like knight takes f3. Which I think is going to work because now I'm threatening the rook in the corner and I'm also threatening queen takes h2 checkmate. I gotta say I didn't plan that out in advance though. I didn't actually see rook takes e5. That white could try to win a pawn like that. If this works, it was... Sort of lucky, but I mean, at maximum, it looked like White was going to win a pawn out of that. And me already being up a piece, it wouldn't have been the end of the world. But it looks like it does backfire due to those dual threats. Yeah, and now Queen takes pawn checkmate. Okay, so this game had some interesting trading uh, situations. So let's go back and have a brief look at that. So we had a double king pawn opening. I don't like d3 on move 3 so much for white. It's not like an awful move or anything, but it needlessly locks in the light square bishop. So I would prefer more theoretical moves here, like bishop c4, the Joko piano or Italian game, or bishop b5, the Ruy Lopez Spanish game. There's other stuff too, like d4, knight c3. So after d3, I just tried to develop my pieces logically. Bishop outside the pawn chain. Castle. I did play this rook pawn move, a6. That's not a move I would play lightly. There has to be some sort of reason behind it, especially if you're going to be doing this with black this early on in the game. My reasoning was that if white ever plays knight a4 trying to hunt down my bishop, I can tuck it away on a7. Because again, you don't want to give up bishops for knights just randomly for no particular reason. So... White played bishop g5, and I answered with h6. So first major trading decision. And if white had played bishop h4, I was probably going to play g5. This is a device you can use if you haven't castled yet and your opponent has in these e4, e5 positions. Is that the knight, if the bishop is driven back to g3, 
I can make a strong argument for attacking white on the king side using my pawns that are already somewhat advanced. And this bishop may very well be out of play on g3 for the rest of the game. There's a classic game if you want to look up something on this theme. Winter versus Capablanca, where Capablanca as black demonstrated how poorly placed this bishop can be, especially in a reduced material position. So I'm not actually sure white should play bishop g5 on move number 9, or move number 7 rather. They might be better off playing bishop e3, offering a bishop for bishop trade, because I have an inkling that black has nothing to fear after h6, bishop takes f6, queen takes, as happened in the game. I have the bishop pair now. This knight is temporarily active on d5, but unless it creates some further threats, I don't see it being a long-term uh, problem for me. Sometimes if white does launch the knight into d5, they'll try to follow up with a move like c3 and then d4. So maybe white should do that here, but c3, I think I can just castle d4, maybe bishop back to a7. I should be fine. So I think that trade was a slight net gain for black. Now c4 I don't like because that means that white can no longer use a pawn to attack or defend the d4 square. So they can never contest a piece that I put on d4 with one of their pawns. They have to deal with it using one of their pieces, like a knight for knight trade or something. So I castled. I could have played bishop g4 as well in that position. White played a3, and now bishop g4. So originally I thought this idea was not working due to maybe that tactic from the previous game had me gun shy, right? Because I was worried about knight takes e5. But I think I can play bishop takes e2. And if knight takes c6, again, in between move, I can just take back on c6. And white has two pieces under attack. They need to address the queen situation. Take. I've won a piece. So once I saw that that was the case, I had to go ahead in my brain to play bishop to g4. So bishop g4, white played b4. I'm just dropping the bishop back. b5, so white continues expanding on the queen side. They do have more pawns over there, and they've been pushing. So now I traded, got rid of the knight, specifically so that I can get my knight up to d4. That's the rationale behind this trade. We're not just doing it willy-nilly. It's connected to a plan. So sinking the knight into d4 is the objective, and i got to remove one of the defenders. I don't want to do it right now. Knight d4 would be a big blunder after knight takes d4. Then my bishop on g4 would be attacked by white's bishop. So we remove that first. And I can point to having conquered that d4 square as my compensation for having given up the bishop. So a4, put the bishop on c5. <clears throat> and now c6, so I am offering a pawn trade with that move, but I'm trying to use it to kick out the knight from d5. That's the whole point of this move. So take, take, knight back to e3. I was running a little short on time at this point, but I think white maybe should have focused on trying to swap knights. So maybe knight to c2 right here, looking for a a knight knight trade. I would have a pretty strong bishop even in this case. Like imagine if something like this occurred. I love my bishop on d4. I feel like it's a lot more effective than white's bishop over here. But could I break down white's position? That's still up in the air because as long as white defends a4 and doesn't lose that pawn outright, I still have quite a bit of ground I need to um, cover before I can win this guy. Maybe I would continue with queen a6 and look to triple on the file. Attack this weakness and this weakness. So after white put the knight on c4, yeah, and, and here I probably should have played, by the way, rook a6 or maybe rook a7. Rook a5 was kind of asking for knight c4. I'm not sure I should have done that. Then white played king h1. They were probably correct to look for play on the king side because I do control matters in the center and to some degree on the queen side. <clears throat> Even though white has this pass pawn, it's not going anywhere. So I think white was correct to do that. Sorry, <clears throat> my voice is like giving out right now. It'll be fine. I just need to drink some water. So king h1, queen g5. <clears throat> f3, I feel like Hillary Clinton or something. Rook a8, bishop d7. Yeah, now d5. 
And when white takes on d5, I think this is another minor concession. Maybe white should have tried to play without that chop on d5. So move the knight away somewhere. Knight back to d2 is probably the best way. Again, maybe trying for knight b3, looking to trade the knights. Because by taking on d5 instead, they are giving up a little bit, right? So they take and I get two center pawns against white's one. And possibly more importantly, the d3 pawn is isolated. It has no pawn right next to it. So knight back to b2, queen to e7, hitting the bishop. That is a loose piece. And then I targeted that pretty poorly placed knight. Knights on Fianchetto squares, like g2 or g7 or b2 and b7, they tend to be poorly placed, in my experience. Yeah, now white blundered a piece. This was a little unfortunate for them. <clears throat> but even if white had played, like, rook b1 or rook a2... I can lean on that piece. I can play like rook b6 and reply, and even double if necessary. Let's say queen d2, double up. I think that knight is just a goner. If it moves away, the rook is dead behind it. Maybe rook a2 was a better try in this position. That way they stay out of the pin, but I, th I think it's still pretty unpleasant for white. The queen up here. Yeah, just further attack that piece. Rook b6, rook b8, also possible. And after the knight was blundered or sacrificed, it was fairly easy. Just with time pressure, got to make sure you're not dropping anything. I had some loose pieces. Rook takes e5 was, in theory, like a nice little idea for white. Because they're trying to deflect my queen away, which was overloaded, trying to defend both c4 and e5. But I, I think tactically it just doesn't work due to this double attack. Yeah, undefended piece on a1. Threat of mate here. But again, you can see how the trades play into this, especially the minor piece trades in that game. That tends to be the case with e4, e5 openings, especially these calmer lines with like d3 and d6. Okay, let's search for one more game. I'm going to play one more and then call this video a wraps. Okay, on Satsu, 13, 14, 52... Let's play a Sicilian this time. Well, I think Ansatsu was uh, waiting in the wings. He wanted to play. So he must have had his, his finger on the mouse, finger on the trigger, ready to accept. Okay, let's just play d6. Good luck, Ansatsu. So we're playing a Sicilian, just like the first game. I'm going to play the main move, knight out to f6, hitting the pawn on e4. Now, what variation do I want to play? Let's keep it simple. Let's play knight c6, the classical Sicilian. Let's see if we can get our opponent to take on c6. Ansatsu hasn't watched this video yet, so maybe I can convince him to make some poor trades. All right, f3. I can play in a number of ways against that. Let's play e5. Let's really put him to the test. Let's see if he wants to make that trade, or if he knows that generally you shouldn't do that trade in the Sicilian. I think he's smart. I think he knows that the trade is, is not positive for white and that black will get enhanced center control if white makes it so i expect ansatsu that yep, there he goes he moved the knight away well done sir okay so let's play bishop e7 just getting ready to castle i do have this weakness on d5 that i have to be aware of that is a a potential hole that white can use for their knight so the basis for a plan for white might be similar to the last game they could try to play the bishop out to g5 Eliminate my knight on f6, and then later jump the knight into d5. Okay, he's just going to play the bishop to e3, though, instead. Let's put our bishop on e6, then. Nice square for this piece. Maybe I can go d5 in the near future. Strategically, I would like to play d5 and offer a trade. That would get rid of white's best pawn in the center, the e4 pawn. And I would get rid of my backward pawn. Like right now, the d6 pawn is my, my major weakness. So if I can advance d5 and swap off for that, I think I'll be pretty happy. The timing of that trade is important, though. I don't know if I want to play it so soon. So if white plays something like queen d2, it'll be interesting to see. Okay, so white jumps into d5. Yeah, intriguing. Yes, okay. Yeah, so I can't take with my knight, definitely, because knight takes, pawn takes, that's a fork on the bishop and the knight. Can't do that. I could take with the bishop, but after pawn takes, I do have to lose some time. 
So I think I'm just going to castle instead. Let's see once again if I can get one of my opponents to come to me with a trade. Knight takes f6 or knight takes e7. I don't think Ansatsu should play one of those moves. I think they should leave this knight on d5. I've already shown with castling that maybe I'm not so keen to trade myself on d5. So maybe he should he should try to take that piece of information and run with it. Yeah, queen d2. If my knight were not on c6, I think I would love to play knight takes d5. But as it stands now, I, I can't do that. Okay, so now I'm thinking about playing a5. But I do have to watch stuff like bishop in, into b6. That could be nasty. Is it that bad, though? Maybe not. Let's try it. So I weaken that b6 square. They can try to sink the bishop in. But after queen d7, I think I'm all right. Knight c7. Uh, knight c7 could be an issue, actually. Rook c8. I might lose the pawn on a5. Hmm. Bishop b6. Probably the most principled move for white in view of what my last move did, like take the pawn away from defending that square. Let's see if he plays it, though. So one of my ideas with a5 is to advance a4 and harass this knight. But also, I have in mind bishop takes d5, e takes d5, knight b4, using the a pawn as a protector, so I can threaten that pawn on d5. I get an outpost for my knight on this square. But bishop b6, that might put my idea to the test. I don't think I lose a pawn in that line. No, I, I probably do, actually. Bishop b6, queen d7, knight c7. Yeah, he's going to go for it. Interesting. Good decision. I mean, I can throw in bishop takes b3 somewhere if, if need be, but I prefer not to have to do that. Any other move than queen d7 makes sense? Probably not. He might even just leave the knight on d5 and just go for a5 anyways. So let's play this. Boy, the two Sicilian games I've played, I've not got good positions. You guys can see why I play d4 as white or knight f3 on move 1. And as black, I'm playing the Scandi. Go team Scandi. <laughs> no, I mean, I have some ex Sicilian experience. You might know I play the con Sicilian quite a bit on this channel. But, um... These two games have just not gone that well in the opening. Okay, knight c7. So white's idea probably is to eliminate the bishop on e6 and then go after this pawn. I might get some counterplay in the center, though. Okay, so let's play rook c8. And if he takes, I'm going to take with the queen. And then when white takes a pit stop to win this pawn, I'm going to try to bust it open with d5 right away. So I'm saying goodbye a pawn, bon voyage, Let's attack in the center and try to claim some counterplay. Time-wise, we're actually ahead. Ansatsu is playing a good game, but he is falling a little behind on the clock. Okay, so I was thinking take with the queen, but you could also make an argument for the pawn capture. I think I am going to go with queen, though. It just seems like a more coherent way of capturing. Yeah, let's do queen. I don't mess up my structure. So that was a good trade as far as white's concerned, I think. They get rid of my light square bishop, so they have the bishop pair, and also they're in the process of winning a pawn. Let's see if they play knight takes a5, as I think they probably should. And then, if knight takes a5 is played, do I want to go d5 right away, or should I play knight takes knight first? I th I'm leaning towards d5 immediately. However, after pawn takes d5, knight takes d5, white would have bishop to c4, pinning my knight. So maybe there is an argument to be made for trading on a5 first, and then playing d5, specifically so that my rook on c8 
has control over the c-file and can access the c4 square, prevent white from playing bishop c4. Hmm, he's going to take with the bishop instead. All right, so do I take this bishop? First instinct, no. I don't think that would be an immediately beneficial trade. Like, this bishop doesn't make a strong impression on the side of the board. I feel like I can always take it if I want. Whereas here I can play... Well, again, there's that, that issue with bishop c4, isn't there? The bishop c4 move is creeping. So again, I would like to play d5, but pawn takes d5, knight takes d5, bishop c4. How do I hurt white after that? Knight takes a5, they can even take on d5 then. In between move. Hmm. So knight takes, knight takes. That hits this pawn as well. Maybe b6, knight b3, and then d5. That could be the way forward. Yeah, let's do that. So we're going to take, and then probably b6. Just don't like this knight supporting a future bishop c4. d5 pawn takes, queen takes maybe, but somehow proposing a queen trade queen tra doesn't seem quite right. So yeah, let's, let's play that move. Kick the knight backward. Really want to get in d5. I can't play kind of slower normal moves now. I am down a pawn, so I need to try to make up for that somehow. Down material, usually have to play dynamically. Try to seize the initiative. Otherwise, you're just a sitting duck. Your opponent's going to gradually convert the material. I'm getting saved by the clock once again. My opponents are just playing really cautiously. <laughs> He's going to be under a minute soon. He already is under a minute. Knight b3. All right. We're all in. d5. Let the die be cast. Yeah, white's behind in development, so they have to tread carefully. I think they'll be fine if they negotiate the uh, lack of development. Like, maybe they can castle here. Yep, there, there white goes. Or bring the bishop out soon. Now my knight on d5 is attacked. I think just rook over to d8 makes sense. Maybe looking for discoveries. Bishop g5 would be really nice, but that just drops a bishop. Ah, knight b4. Why am I not looking at knight b4? Knight b4 looks awfully strong, doesn't it? Yeah, we gotta play that move. Hits c2, also hits a2. That should have that move should have just popped up on my radar instantly. Took me a second to find it though. Supported by my bishop, so that knight is fine, but we've got the double attack here. If white plays c3, then I could play knight takes a2 followed by queen takes b3. Yeah, so they make a developing move. Now, the easy move is just to take on a2 here, but I'm looking to see if I have more. Like maybe even rook fd8, trying to strengthen some of my ideas. Mm, I'm not going to get greedy, though. We're just going to take... And then pull this knight back to b4. Bishop b4, a little tempting, but probably not sound. So let's just bring this guy back. I got my pawn back. I'm happy about that. This knight is pretty bad on b3. Again, because if white ever pushes the c-pawn, the knight on b3 is undefended. Okay. f4. So if I take, maybe rook e1 is annoying. e4 is the move I'd like to play here which I think is probably good. Yeah, let's go e4. Because that bishop was holding the c2 pawn. If the bishop moves away, rook takes c2 is crashing in. Okay, now we might be able to have some fun. So e takes d3, rook takes e6, take on c2, check. That queen takes c2 kind of kills my fun <laughs> a little bit. Just a little bit. Ah, oh, bummer. I'd really like to play that. Take d3, rook takes e6. Take c2, check. And I think white has to play queen takes c2. I don't see any other good moves. 
And then whichever way I take back, they are taking my bishop on e7. I still have a pretty nice position, but I feel like also this move is pretty solid, so I'm going to do that. Queen e2, getting out of the way. Okay. Ah, I think maybe on the last move I could have just won a piece, right? Knight takes d3, was winning a piece? Yeah, yeah, that knight on b3 would have fell. So missed opportunity right there for me. Let's play bishop f6. Because now if knight takes d3, there's queen, there's rook takes d3, actually. That just drops a piece, right? Queen takes c4, supported by my rook. Blitz is tough, guys. And you can see I'm making mistakes. My opponent's making mistakes. No one plays perfect blitz. No one plays perfect chess. So... The faster the time control, the more likely you are to make big mistakes like you're seeing a bit in this video. Okay, so the rook doubled up. I think I should just attack c2 again. Let's do that. Ah, he's lamenting his last few moves in the chat. Okay, so we win that game. Let's go back through. Not as many um, outright trade situations in this one. There were a lot of decisions driven by tactics and material. So open Sicilian once again. Yeah, knight c6. And on Satsu, uh, I can definitely tell he has some experience on the white side of the Sicilian because I see so many people just chopping on c6, but as we've already described, that doesn't work out favorably for white. So he plays f3. I don't want to take on d4 because that would allow white to bring out their queen. And it's hard to harass their queen unless I want to play e5, which isn't as good now that a pair of knights has been traded. Uh, one reason for that is I think white will have an easier time conquering the d5 square if they undertake some plan like bishop here and try to take on the square. So I, I'd actually prefer to have that pair of knights on the board, and I don't want to assist white's development. So f3, I decided to play e5. I don't have as much experience with this particular pawn structure, but it looked like just a way to try to challenge him and see, again, if he was willing to take on c6 or not. More often, I do operate with the pawn on e6 instead. So e5, because you do undertake this strategic risk of weakening the d5 square. You gain a little more space, but that's the price you pay. Bishop e7, bishop e3. So if white was intent on trying to bring about that plan, then you know bishop g5 could be considered. But I wonder if bishop g5 has the same problem as we kind of saw in the in the previous in that first game I played from the white side, knight takes e4 or h6 first. Here I guess maybe one difference is that after this there is knight takes d6 check possible. So white probably could consider bishop to g5. Not that there's anything wrong with bishop e3 either, but that was a possibility. So bishop e3, bishop e6, knight d5. And this is a little annoying, not going to lie. I mean, in retrospect, maybe I should take on d5 with the bishop and then play this sort of anti-developing move, knight to b8, looking to come out to d7. But I thought I could kind of deal with the knight on d5, and it turned out to be maybe... Um, Better a better decision to actually take it early on and try to play this way. Could also play knight b4 here, but I feel like my knight is kind of floating out there. It doesn't have the a5 pawn for, for protection. I am attacking this guy, but maybe white can throw in a check and try to disrupt my coordination. I might have to move my king then. Still, though, I think I should have considered that. So going to this position, I castled. White played queen d2. And now I played perhaps a bad move, a5. I didn't think the whole bishop b6 thing through and the fact that my pawn just might be hanging in a lot of lines. And I was looking for other ways for counterplay because white is sort of controlling matters in the center. And just to speak to trades once more, Ansatsu is recognizing that the status quo of this knight on the d5 square benefits him. He doesn't want to make it easy for me by trading on f6 or e7. Even though like taking on e7, he would win the bishop pair. Look what that does to my coordination. 
I get my queen off the back rank, I connect my rooks, and I'm primed to play d5. Maybe I could stop that with c4, but I don't think I would have minded this scenario as much as the one that happened in the game, where I was kind of cramped and ended up losing a pawn. So that's the sort of thing you want to be thinking about too. How are those trades working for you or against you? So a5, bishop into b6. I played queen d7. Yeah, knight c7. I moved my rook over. And now he took on e6. So white does end up winning this pawn, but in return I get some play for it. And as I was saying, if you're down material and your position is kind of going south, you got to look for dynamic counterplay. Like, don't make the mistake of thinking that you need to actually turtle up and play passively. No, like, that's not the time to do it. Um, very rarely should you actually go completely passive in a chess position, by the way. But especially if you're down material, you're not going to... You're not going to get back in the game by keeping things even keeled for the most part. I mean, mentally you should be even keeled, but you should try to find some way to disrupt the position, force your opponent to a, a difficult decision. So that's why I broke with d5. I mentioned early on that this generally is a good move for black to get in in the Sicilian, get rid of their backward pawn, trade off for the pawn here. I'm starting to feel like I have some play. And white castled and opened themselves up for knight b4. And now I was truly back in the game. I think white might be in some trouble at this point. So probably white should have played a bishop move round about here. Like bishop e2, try to whisk the king away to the king side. I think the king side is where they would like to end up. Black has some compensation, maybe not enough though. And just very briefly, after I won back the pawn, yeah, white offers a trade of pawns there, but I didn't see a reason to do this. Now that I'm looking at the ideas connected with knight takes d3 more, I do see I could try to win a pawn here. Knight takes d3. White can't take with the pawn because they would lose the, the loose piece on b3. So knight takes d3, queen takes d3. Then I could take on f4. That would win a, p a pawn. So that was one option. But I think the real moment after e4, which is probably decent, right here, I think I could have just played knight takes d3 right now. That should just win a, a clean piece. Again, pawn takes, we take here. And if queen takes instead, then I take the queen. They take my queen, but I take here check. In between move, fork the king and the rook. This is, white's going to lose everything. King c1, take, take, take this guy. We're up two rooks. So missed opportunity for me right there. That would have been a nice way to highlight white's undefended piece. I played the solidifying move, f5, instead. Maybe white should get crazy here. Although, actually, I still am threatening this move, aren't I? So maybe white's queen e2 is not so bad. But this was annoying because now if I take, they can actually take with the rook. And they avoid a lot of their issues. I can't take with the pawn due to queen takes e6 check. So, yeah, I played bishop f6 instead. And here, fortunately for me, on Satsu blundered. It is kind of a tough position, but maybe they can look for some way to disturb my pawn structure. Like, I was thinking g4 might be a good way to try to undermine the f5 and the e4 pawns which are causing quite a lot of trouble okay why don't we do one more game so this will be the very last game my voice is coming back a little bit let's play one more and see if we can get some some good trade discussions going on once again and also this is an opportunity for me to actually play a good game <laughs> so hope for that too And Elm has been asking in the chat. I think some people think I'm streaming or um, doing something similar. Okay, rule Milano again. Let's play d4 in this game. Good luck to you again, Raul. Raul plays the Dutch. Okay, what do I want to play against this? I could play a line that I propose on Chessable. Let's give that a shot. So knight c3, and then bishop g5. Creating tension between the bishop and the knight. Now, we've already talked about this type of scenario quite frequently. You're probably gathering that bishop versus knight trades, or potential trades, happen a lot in chess, especially in the opening. So I'm not going to take here, because I don't double up black's pawns. Black can just take with the queen. I am going to play e4, though. So if pawn takes, I can take with the knight and further attack that pin piece. Black plays bishop e7. All right, so I have an intriguing decision to make. 
Now black is threatening to take on e4 and win a pawn. Knight takes e4. So I should release the tension somehow. And I don't think defending the pawn is any good. So I'm looking at either e5 or taking. If I take on f5, black's just going to replace that pawn. But if I play e5 and avoid the trade, I win a tempo by attacking this knight. And I don't think black's knight like has too many good squares. At least that's not the way it seems to me. Yeah, so let's gain that tempo. I didn't feel like f5 was benefiting me much. I would describe that as a neutral trade, if anything. So I think I can get more by playing e5. And now knight g4. I think I would have played knight d5 if I were black. Knight g4 looks awkward. I feel like I can gain some time by attacking this knight. If I make the trade right here, black can bring the queen out. That does help their development. But what else can I really do? I could move my bishop back maybe, but... Well, actually, maybe... Maybe that makes sense. Like, bishop back to, let's say, d2. Maybe I can look to play h3, knight h6, bishop takes h6. Let's try it. So what I'm looking to do here is, again, by avoiding a trade, create more, um, more return on my investment, if you will, for this, this move, this tempo move I'm playing. I'm trying to get black to play knight h6 very soon so I can chop on h6, make an even better trade. Okay, now black is hounding my bishop. They really want that bishop off the board. But now I can potentially make some developing moves like knight f3, attack that bishop, make black come to me. Bishop takes d2, queen takes d2. All of a sudden, I've got a couple pieces out there. Yeah, let's do that. I'm not going to kick this knight even yet. I'm just going to play a good developing move, attack the bishop again, and look at that, I got my queen out and my knight out because I avoided that trade. Didn't take on e7 right away. That's the power of thinking about how these trades work out for you. Okay, so black castles. I can castle queenside right now if I want and maybe storm him. I could also try to play in the center. I am going to go queenside. Let's make this a rumble. Knight h6. Okay, so black's development is really lacking on the queen side. Normally, with opposite side castling, you should immediately prepare a um, pawn storm and just try to get at your opponent as quick as possible. But the reason why I'm not so keen about that plan here is black doesn't have too many weaknesses on the king side. I mean, as potentially sketchy as they played the opening, uh, it's not so easy to take them down with a storm because of this pawn on f5 in particular. I could try h3 followed by g4, but I'm liking this d5 advance. I gotta be honest. I think breaking through in the center, you know, I've got my queen and my rook lined up on the d file. I got my knight supporting. I mentioned black's severe lack of development on this wing, which does translate to weakness in the center. So let's let's strike while the iron is hot, d5. Pawn for pawn trade. If black takes, I can take with my queen and deliver check. And also I'll have my queen staring down that d7 pawn. So black decides that trade is not worth it for them. And maybe correctly so. Queen e8 though, what did this pawn, what did this weaken for black? What is now undefended? Pawn on c7. So I'm thinking, can I shoot my knight up to b5, attack that guy, and derive some benefit from that? Knight b5, I guess black can play knight a6, but maybe then d6? Pawn d6? Yeah, let's do it. So hit that c7 pawn. Knight a6, d6. If pawn takes d6, then knight takes d6. I have a almost a permanent outpost on the d6 square. So black should probably play c6 there, in which case they're very, very cramped. Although the position's a little closed, I will admit. Maybe I should play queen c3 right now. Queen c3 and try to attack the pawn on c7 a bit more. Hit that weakness again. Yeah, let's see how he reacts to that. So attacking c7 again. If pawn takes d5, I'll probably just take c7. I don't think I'll bother with taking on d5 yet because that would allow maybe c6, although then even I have knight d6. But let's take here if we can. If black plays queen to d8, then I could take on e6 and they'd be pinned along the file. This move is probably a good idea. 
black attacks f2 makes me take a timeout to defend that pawn which i think i should do let's play rook d2 i did see knight g4 when i played queen c3 i just didn't mention it i'm not playing that bad tonight although it has been <laughs> subpar <laughs> those sicilian games Okay, what are you going to do, Rule? Yeah, so he buckles with c6. Now I get my knight into the promised land, into that d6 square. Do I take first or do I play knight d6 immediately? Probably knight d6 immediately. Let's just be flexible. Depending upon where the queen goes, maybe we have more options. and We can decide which capture we want to make. d takes c6 or d takes e6. They might resolve to the same position if black takes with the d-pawn in either case, but you never know. Good to, good to have options. So queen e7. I think I'm going to take on c6 just to give black a chance to go wrong and blunder a piece. If d takes c6, b takes c6, I have knight takes c8, followed by bishop takes a6. I do see a way I can also win a pawn with this whole transaction, but first let's take and just give black a chance to mess up. Okay, black correctly takes that way. All right, so decision time for me. I can win a pawn here. And if you notice the combo to win a pawn, good job. I can play bishop takes a6, pawn takes a6, queen takes c6, which also hits the rook here. The only thing is, like, he's going to get some play because of that. He can maybe get his bishop out, and there are open files on the queen side. So that may not be the worst thing that's ever happened to black. I can also try to continue my stranglehold here. I'm just going to play a developing move. Quite often in the course of a game, you'll have that decision if you want to cash in on material or if you want to continue like twisting the knife, trying to extract maximum positional gain. And that's what I'm doing right here. Knight c5, okay. So maybe looking to get into the e4 square. I'm thinking about queen d4 just to attack that knight and also deny him the e4 square. Yeah, let's do that. I might kick this knight back with h3 at some stage soon, but I can probably hold off on it. I should also be looking at knight takes f5 tactics to see if that ever works out. Because my bishop on c4 pins their pawn on e6, but black does have the rook here, so I can't do it yet. Knight e4. Okay, so this appears to just lose a pawn. Knight takes, pawn takes, queen takes. Yeah, I don't see any tricks for black. So let's gather that pawn. And we hit that knight on g4. Undefended piece. I think black has to back this up. And then I can play rook h to d1 and stop that bishop from coming to d7. So I think knight c5 and into e4 was just a, a bad decision by black position wasn't very pleasant but i think that makes it even worse for them okay knight f5 so again queen takes f5 not working but it's on the radar sort of looking at playing a move like h4 here this seems kind of random given that i've been playing in the center but i'm just gaining a little space i might be able to use g5 for my knight in the future i'm also curious what black intends to do here because black is pretty bound Bound and tied. There's just not a lot for them to uh, to do. So I throw the move back at my opponent in a tough situation. Likewise, a helpful move could be king b1. If ever I wanted to tuck my king away, I could do that. Here I think the king is almost as safe on c1 as it is on b1. So a lot of times you'll play king b1 just to get out of issues with the diagonal here or defend the a2 pawn. In this case, I don't think it's necessary. Okay, so now maybe I can go knight g5 and attack this pawn on e6. Yeah, we can even follow it up with g4 very soon. So let's do that. Threaten e6, and pawn g4 is coming up, hitting the knight and hopefully crashing through on h7 behind it.
That discussion about uh, trading on your own terms in this game, when I pulled the bishop back to d2, that's an important one. Like if you find yourself thinking in those terms, like that's already a sign that you've absorbed some of the stuff I'm think I'm talking about today in this video. Because most players, they don't ever think in those terms, or if they do, it's like very fleeting. Okay, so I have checkmate here. Queen takes h7. So we end on a good game. Let's run through that real quick. So open with d4, black played the Dutch. And if you want to check out my recommendations in this line, go to Chessable and check out my d4 repertoire for white. Free repertoire where I go through about 40 lines outlining a d4 repertoire. And this is the line I propose against the Dutch. So after knight f6, playing bishop g5, which already introduces some favorable trading ideas for white, taking on f6 and trying to um, weaken black structure in the process, make them take back with the pawn. Like one move black often plays here is this, and take, take, e3, white has a slightly better structure, can look forward to attacking these guys in the future. So going back here, Black played e6, and now I don't think I want to trade because black can just take with the queen, and I don't see any benefit from having made that trade. So e4. And normally black plays pawn takes, knight takes, which is very similar to the open Sicilian, right? Because I've given up one of my center pawns for one of black's wing pawns. But I gained a nice knight in the middle and further pressure on f6. That would be what I'm, I'm benefiting from that trade. Again, you always got to have something in mind. If someone were to just come up to you, some other chess player, or even some non-chess player, and say, hey, like, why did you trade that pawn for that pawn or that knight for that knight? You should have something in your head that you're able to tell them just immediately. If you're like, uh, I don't know, um, well, it looked good at the time, that's not good enough. So e4, black played bishop e7. And now, <clears throat> by advancing to e5, I gain a tempo. Taking on f5, didn't see what I was benefiting from by making this capture. Maybe I can claim that this diagonal is open, but if I play bishop c4, maybe black can play d5 sometime soon. Not sure if they can do it now due to bishop takes f6. So maybe I could consider this line of play, bishop c4. e5 was a hard move to pass up though, gaining the tempo on the knight. So e5, knight moves away, maybe knight d5 was better, but knight g4. I'd be curious what the computer says about this move. If anyone wants to run this game through the engine, let me know and, and post it in the comments because I would be genuinely curious. Because bishop takes e7 is going to kind of help black. He gets the queen out. He was able to trade uh, under the circumstances he wants. Whereas bishop d2 keeps him tied down. And in a couple more moves, after black plays bishop g5, moving the same piece again in the opening, I play knight f3. I get a developing move in with tempo. He takes, my queen comes out. It's basically like I got these two moves in for free, these two developing moves, specifically because I avoided the trade. I backed down and played a strategic retreat, bishop d2. So black castled, I castled. I really think black has to start focusing on their queen side development. Knight h6, I don't like that move because it's an unprovoked retreat. I haven't attacked that knight yet. It was being kind of annoying in attacking f2. So I think black should wait for me to play h3 before they do that. And now I struck in the center, d5, offering a trade. If black takes, then queen takes is coming with check. Further initiative for white. Black has to lose time, can't develop their queen side. So black plays queen e8. And you know from video one about undefended pieces, we always want to be targeting those points in our opponent's camp. So I immediately shifted to attacking c7, a newly created weakness because the queen isn't guarding it. Knight b5 on that pawn. Knight a6, queen c3, hit this pawn twice. If black plays queen d8 here, we have d takes e6. And black can't take back because they lose the queen. So after queen c3, knight g4, the knight came back to attack f2. I thought just defending this pawn was prudent, so I did that. And now c6, and I got to jump into this square with tempo on the queen. Take on c6. Here I was testing Raul Milano. If b takes c6, we have knight takes c8, followed by bishop takes a6, win a piece. So he correctly did this. And now bishop c4. So this is also kind of instructive, because 
as I was explaining, there's often cases in the course of a game where you can win a little bit of material. Like here I could do this. But that would have the effect of actually freeing Black's position. After, say, bishop d7, they finally get this bishop out. Their rooks are connected. Maybe Black is not like completely torn up about the fact that they lost a pawn on the queen side because my king is sitting here. Now I'd have to go into consolidation mode, probably play kind of defensively for a while to make sure Black doesn't whip up a quick attack. So I thought, why do that when I have such a grip on the position and this bishop is so bad on c8 and there's just not really a lot of coordination going on in White's camp. So I just played bishop c4. I think Black maybe should play knight c7 or maybe bishop d7. I would try to connect the rooks in some way very soon. With knight c7, maybe they could plant the knight on d5 and try to break my rook's communication with the knight on d6. Instead, knight c5 here, and here's where things fell apart for black because knight e4 just dropped a pawn. And now they had to move the knight from g4, doubled up the rooks. This is a prophylactic move, stopping bishop d7. I have two attackers on that square. I started playing a bit on the king side. Yeah, we're attacking this weakness on e6. And now combined with g4, black is just done for. Uh, maybe they can survive a little bit if they play a move like h6 and counterattack my knight, but I'm already up a pawn. All my pieces are attacking. It's pretty much lights out. So black wandered into checkmate. Okay. Well, I know these videos are a little longer than normal, so thank you if you stuck through the whole thing. I hope it was helpful for you seeing various trades in action and how I, as an international master, assess them. And if there's one takeaway, just remember that main criteria I said at the very beginning of the video and I've been repeating throughout. If you can't describe why a trade is at minimum uh, neutral for you and preferably advantageous for you, then you probably shouldn't make that trade in the first place. Just bear that in mind always. So let me know if you have any questions about anything in this video or anything related to trading. And uh, I will talk to you guys again soon. Hopefully I can put up another installment of Chess Fundamentals in the near future. You never know. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. Talk to you later. Bye.